be seated. Brother Steve Rice is here. He's from First Baptist Church Sherman, and uh, most of you know him. He's been with us before. We're always so excited to have him here and his wife, Deborah. If you ever call Grace and Baptist Association and get to that friendly voice that says hello, that is his wife, Deborah. And so thank you for all you do for all the, our churches in the, in the county. And so, but uh, you share with us what God has for us. Well, it is a joy to be here with you all today, and I think uh, we'd be amiss not to have just a special word of prayer, thanking the Lord for something that's happened this week. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I think about the I am statements through the Gospel of John. He says, I'm the door, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. We serve a God who celebrates life. Amen. And uh, I know this is a huge step in the right direction. And uh, I want to continue to pray not only for our state, the great state of Texas. Amen. I have a feeling where we're headed toward all this, and I'm so thankful for that, and I'm thankful for Governor Abbott and his stand. I'm not being political. I'm just thankful for the stand that he has made and his consistency about life uh, concerning uh, the life in the womb. And I want us just to pause and just to thank God. Uh, this is something, I'm just being honest with y'all, uh, I kind of felt through my experience as a minister and everything that I just didn't know if this day would ever come. This is monumental, and it shows us that God's still on his throne, and he listens to the prayers of his people. And so we would need to thank God for what has taken place this week. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you so much. Father, we stand in awe of you. Father, I'm reminded of that scripture. Now unto him who can do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask or think. And Father, for one, uh, I guess I was a little skeptic in looking at our country, looking at our world, and just seeing how it just seems to be out of control. But Father, we're reminded that you are in control. And we're grateful today. And Father, we would be amiss if we didn't pause. And I pray churches all across our country would pause today as we gather now to celebrate and to worship and to thank you for the decision that's been made through the Supreme Court. Now we pray that, Father, our states would take up the banner for life. And Father, I pray for this great state of Texas, and I thank you for the leadership that we have here in this state, and I pray that all of our leaders would get on board and we would continue to push, uh, Lord, to protect life. And Father, we thank you again for what you've done this week, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, one of my goals is to help you fall in love more and more with Jesus. Amen. We have sung about him. We have worshipped him. He is the reason that we congregate in a place like this today. Good crowd, by the way. I don't know if this is normal or whatever, but uh, I'm glad to see y'all come on time and uh, that you're here uh, when the preaching starts. Amen. Uh, do you deal with some people kind of come in during? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We deal with all that too. But you came for the good stuff, right? Uh, I really do want to help you uh, fall in love with Jesus even more. I pray that uh, you're already in love with him. But I pray that today when you leave, uh, there'll be a little bit more of a passion about wanting to be in his word. I want to read you a passage that I know you are very familiar with. This isn't the message, but it is part of the introduction. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness 
did not comprehend it. One of the things that God's Word reminds us is that Jesus is the Word. And I want to tell you, when you're spending time in this, you're getting to know Him more. Amen? Something I began to practice in my life many, many years ago. I want to say it's been maybe close to almost 10 years ago or longer. But I read somewhere in the Gospels every morning. Okay? Everybody has your plan of things that you do. I read a proverb uh, for the day. Uh, today being the 26th, read Proverbs 26. A proverb a day will help keep the devil away. All right? Um, the book of Proverbs teaches you how to live, how to live life. It's a great book to invest yourself in. And uh, that was taught to me back when I was about 16 years old. And that's been a practice that I've been trying to practice every day since about 16. And that's been quite a few years ago. We'll just leave it at that, okay? Long, long time ago. But uh, I love reading in the Gospels. And the reason I do is because of something Henry Blackaby said years ago as I went through experiencing God for about the third or fourth time. I think I've been through it seven or eight. Uh, taking different groups through that particular study, a great, great study on knowing and doing the will of God. But one of the things that he said, he talked about the fact that he reads somewhere in the Gospels every day, and the reason that he does is because he wants to stay closely connected to Jesus. Amen? Because the Gospels tell us the story of Jesus. Amen? Now, what I want to do is try to help break down the New Testament for you. If you want to hang around for the second service, I'm going to break down the Old Testament. I know I'm doing a little bit backwards, but I just felt led to do it that way today. So you're going to kind of get uh, the New Testament, uh, and the uh, second crowd will get the Old Testament. But um, I, if you wanted to break down the entire New Testament into two words, this is for those who need it really, really simple. Anybody in here like that? I see three hands, four. Come on, let's be honest. Ten, twenty, thirty. Okay, there we go. Now we're getting there. If you want to break down the entire New Testament into two words, can you remember two words? Please say I can. Okay, you can. Remember the name Jesus and remember church. Because that's the entire New Testament. It's about Jesus, and it's about his church that he came to establish. Amen? Now, let's talk about Jesus just for a little bit. If we were to break down his life into four categories, here's how uh, some have broken it down. Now, if you were to tell your story, you would break your life into probably certain categories. So that's kind of what we're going to do with Jesus. The first category of Jesus' life obviously would start with what? Very beginning, very good, with his birth. And we're going to take Jesus' birth through his first 30 years, okay? Now, how much information do we have about Jesus from the time that he was born till he was about 30 years old? Anybody want to venture to guess? Can someone say not much? Okay, because we don't have much. In fact, once you get past the birth of Jesus Christ and the things that surrounded his birth, there's one more story about him. And once you pass that story, we really don't have a whole lot more information about Jesus' life from the time that he was born till he was about 30 years old. Do you remember that other little story in there? Do you remember that one? Okay, that's not the sermon. I'm just asking if you remember. If you don't, maybe it needs to be the sermon. Okay? The story is about him when he was 12 years old. You remember that? I love this story. I uh, preached a message on this years ago, and um, I remember a lady named Linda Ford, and God really touched her heart about the message that came from his word that day about Jesus when he was 12 years old. These are the words that penetrated my heart as I studied that passage and presented the sermon probably 15, maybe 20 years ago now. And it was the phrase where Jesus said, Did you not know? I must. I must be about my father's business. Isn't that a great line? Coming from a 12-year-old. Amen? 
the Son of God, no less. <laughs> Did you not know I must be about the Father's business? Oh, that everybody here today would leave with that kind of a heartbeat to walk out these doors and say, Oh, do you not know I must be about my Father's business? I love that story. Now, once we get past that first segment of Jesus' life, birth through 30 years, then we get to what I call his public ministry, okay? His public ministry lasted about how long? Anybody tell me? About three years, good. Brother Mike has done a really good job. In fact, when I came in this morning, I uh, forgot uh, the, the man that I met handed me uh, a little flyer or whatever. I said, well, I hear y'all need a preacher today. He said, just for today. Just for today. I think Mike would appreciate that. Amen. Just for today. I thought that was pretty good. I'm glad you love your pastor. Uh, I love Brother Mike. He's a good man. And uh, uh, so many stories I could tell you that I won't. Uh, I've got one really good one I am really tempted to tell, but I'm not going to tell it today. I just don't have that liberty just yet. Maybe by a second service. We'll see. But when we think about Jesus' public ministry, how much information do we have concerning his public ministry, the things that he did, the teaching and the healing and all the things? How much information do we have? Quite a bit. In fact, that's what the Gospels are full of. It's almost as if the Gospels hurry past the first 30 years so they could get to the good stuff, to when the ministry actually started. Not that he wasn't about the Father's business, because he was about that at age 12, but at the age of 30, I kind of start the public ministry of Jesus at his baptism. That's kind of where I begin the public ministry in my mind, where he went public and he was baptized. And then from that point on, this world has never been the same. Can someone say amen? So we have a lot of information in the Gospels about the public ministry, but I have two more categories that I like to break down the life of Jesus into. And those are the last week of his life, because those last seven days, I mean, folks, everything began to really come together. In fact, y'all know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell the story of Jesus, but they all tell it from their perspective, okay? It'd be like someone who witnessed maybe a little fender bender that happened out here, and there were four different people that saw it. Police comes around, and they say, well, we need to get your eyewitness account. So we come to Jackie and say, Jackie, what did you see? And Jackie gives me his perspective. And then I go to my wife, Deborah. Then I go to Karen. I go to Doug. I find out from these four people who were seeing from a different perspective, they give me their perspective of what they saw. Then I put it all together to try to reconstruct what happened, okay? Well, when Matthew wrote, he had a specific group of people in mind as he wrote. Do you remember who those people were? They were Jewish people. So as Matthew wrote, he had Jewish thought, Jewish custom, Jewish law in, in mind as he wrote his gospel. Mark wrote to the Romans. So as Mark wrote, he had Roman thought, Roman custom, Roman law in his mind as he wrote to his particular audience. Now, don't think that's strange when you write a letter and you write it to a specific person. There are certain things you're going to say in that letter. It wouldn't make sense to other people because... That letter's not to them. But it makes a lot of sense to the person you're writing to because there's some common ground that you have. And that's kind of what you see with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke wrote to the Greek people, Theophilus in particular. That's where I was in the Gospels this morning. It was Luke chapter 1. I've started over. I try to read through the Gospels twice a year. I just finished up. A little few days early, by the end of June, I try to finish up all the Gospels. I'll start over in July. So I started over just a couple of days ago, and I'm in uh, Luke 1 chronologically. Uh, and uh, I was just reminded again how God had given Luke perfect understanding concerning all these things of Christ. And he writes to Theophilus that he might have an accurate account of all those things. So that's who Luke had in mind. And who did John have in mind as he wrote? You. He had the Gentiles. That's why we have so many phrases in the Gospel of John that will say something like, for God so loved the world. He had the world in view, the Gentile people in view. 
And that's one of the best Gospels probably for a new Christian to begin to read because it makes probably more sense coming from a Gentile perspective, not a Jewish, a Roman, or a Greek. Now, they're all good. Amen? And when you put them all together, I call it the Paul Harvey version of studying the Bible. You have to be about 40 years old to get that joke. The Paul Hart, some of you young ones, y'all can look that up later. The Paul Harvey version. So you've got before his public ministry, you have his public ministry, you have the last week of his life, and then the very last category I put in there because it's such, such a monumental uh, segment of Jesus' life. It's what I call the post-resurrection period. Does anybody remember how many days Jesus walked on this earth after he was resurrected. Anybody want to venture to say? Don't guess. I don't want to embarrass you. But does someone know? I have one person that knows. If you know, raise your hand. Be careful. I may call on you. Okay? That's one man back there that knows for sure. We got one half. When the, ha when the hand's halfway up, it means I think I know. Okay? I'll tell you what. I'll give you a multiple choice. Three days, 12 days, 40 days, 180 days. Forty days, very good. I kind of helped you out there a little bit, didn't I? During those 40 days, that's kind of a long time. A post-resurrection period that Jesus walked on this earth and interacted with people. And during that time, we have 11 accounts of him appearing to either a person or to groups of people. I remember preaching this years ago, and uh, there were two people in my church at uh, First Baptist Redwater where I pastored for 15 years. And I remember preaching this, and uh, I was on this particular subject about the 11 appearances, and I said, and even one time, he appeared to over 500 people. After the service was over, there was a lady named Myrna Martin. She was the, I uh, came to learn, was the kind of the history buff of the Bible, for First Baptist Redwater, was a matriarch of the church, so to speak. And she made a beeline up to me, and she said, I want you to show me in the Bible where it says he appeared over 500. I had a cold sweat break over me. I thought, D did I get that right? I, I, I know it. It's in my notes. I, I, did I just hear that? I mean, be careful. <clears throat> Do you all believe it's in there? Do you know where it's at? Is it Matthew? Mark? Luke or John? Anybody want to guess? Wrong. 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 It's not any of those. It's in Corinthians. In the Corinthian letter, it tells us that at one point he appeared to over 500 people. Try to keep that in the box. Try to keep that quiet. Well, it didn't work. We're still talking about him today. Amen. So thankful that, I, I want to tell you, it's like... Uh, these disciples, when they were able to interact with Jesus, their passion was like put on steroids. After being able to see him, remember Thomas? Remember how, remember how Jesus just kind of met Thomas where he was? Because Thomas says, I will not believe unless, unless, and then Jesus actually appears to Thomas later with all of them and says, Thomas, come, touch my hand, put your hand on my side. He kind of met him where he was. Isn't that good? Do you believe Jesus still does that today? Say, of course. Of course he does. All right. So, public ministry, before public ministry, public ministry, the last week of his life, and then the next 40 days or the post-resurrection appearances. Now, I got intrigued with uh, what's called the harmony of the Gospels probably about 25 years ago. Uh, I began to pastor a church. And uh, never had pastored before. I was 36 years old. I'd heard of the harmony of the Gospels, but I really didn't understand it like I understand it today. I have spent a large portion of my life studying the harmony of the Gospels, and I've fallen in love with it. And so I decided years ago that I needed to do my own study for my own purpose. And so I began to break down all the events of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and put them in chronological order. Very hard thing to do. Other men have done it before, and I used their material to kind of base some of mine off of why create the wheel. 
when it's already being created, right? But I felt like I needed to do it for myself and, and give each one of those events its own name that made sense to me. And I like for each one of those to start off with the name Jesus because it really is about him. Like Jesus healed the sick. Jesus fed the 5,000. Jesus uh, raised Lazarus from the dead. I like to start off with the name Jesus. So I did that, and I came up with 199 events. Some of you are thinking, why couldn't you come up with 200? It would have made it easier, right? But that's what I came up with. I wasn't trying to come up with a certain number, but that's the number that I came up with, 199. Now, as I have begun to study over my life now, those 199 events, I have become intrigued. Needless to say, absolutely intrigued. And I like to do it in different ways, but I want to point something out to you that I think is pretty uh, unique. In the 199 events that you take out of the Gospels that talk about the life of Jesus, all 199 events, y'all do understand that maybe John will tell an event that no one else does, right? Y'all understand that? In fact, there's five miracles that he teaches that are not listed anywhere else. Turning water into wine and raising Lazarus from the dead, those are two of the five that only John talks about. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they don't mention it, but John does. Out of the 199 events, there are 16 events that all four Gospels tell us. Only 16. I find that unusual, and I find those 16 events to be pretty significant, okay? And uh, out of those 16, there's one miracle that all four Gospels tell us about. All four. And only one miracle. Anybody want to guess what that miracle might be? It's one that you know well. You would think you should know it well because it's in all four Gospels, right? It is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Now, if you have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and turn. Uh, this is kind of where we're going to land today, all right? And um, I know I get to preach as long as I want to, but I also know we have Sunday school teachers that want to teach their class. So I'm keeping all that in mind. Y'all keep praying for me. This is hard. Okay. So turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to read Matthew's account of the feeding of the 5,000. I don't know if you're accustomed to doing this. I just love doing it. I don't get to preach as often. Some of you know where I'm going with that already, don't you? If you, ha if you have your Bibles and you can stand with me physically, please stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll start Matthew 14, starting in verse 13. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by a boat to a deserted place <clears throat> by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and he healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Can you imagine them looking at each other like, what in the world is he talking about? Has he lost his mind? And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. The disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and they were filled. That's how we know they were Baptists. Amen. So they all ate and were filled. Thank you for Karen Wade's cookies. Amen. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Thank you. Be seated. Now, let me. y'all mind if I make an observation or two? I hope you don't because I'm going to, okay? The only miracle that all four Gospels tell us, and you know, I would have almost, I'm not a betting man, but I would have almost bet that in the story of the feeding of the 5,000 that there was a little boy mentioned somewhere, and I just didn't see that anywhere. So has that been made up? Is that something we just threw in there and figured, well, it must have been a little boy that brought the five loaves and the two fish? 
Or is that really part of the story? Y'all are looking really confused, like you're scared to death to answer that question. No, there is a little boy in the story. Matthew just doesn't tell us about him. In fact, if we didn't have John's gospel, we would never know that there was a little boy that gave what he had. Isn't it something how we can learn from children? I mean, sometimes we can be so selfish. You know, you don't have to teach a child how to be selfish. It's kind of built into them. It's called the sin nature. And you see that at age two and three really, really quick when they have toys and someone else wants to play with the toy. The fight is on. And we didn't teach them to do that. It comes very, very natural. But here's a boy who gave what he had, and look what Jesus did with it. Pretty amazing. Folks, there's uh, some amazing things about this particular story, and I know uh, this is not going to help you at all, but uh, I just kind of want you all to, especially way back there in the back, I know you ain't going to see this, but I have all the different things that Matthew talked about, Mark, Luke, and John. And what I did is I listed everything that Mark mentioned, put it in a bullet form, then I mentioned things in Mark that Matthew didn't mention. Then I mentioned things in John, uh, Luke that neither one of Matthew nor Mark mentioned. Then I mentioned things in John. Look what all John has that Matthew, Mark, and Luke doesn't have. Wouldn't it be nice if someone would take the time to take all the things that were written about the feeding of the 5,000 and put it in a story form that includes every aspect of that event? Wouldn't that be cool? Well, someone did. I really enjoyed doing it, too. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read you the story that includes every facet that all four Gospels talk about. Here's some of the, the neatest parts of the story that sometimes we get, we, we, they never really make it to the table. All depends on what passage the pastor may use, okay? If he's going to use the John passage, I guarantee you, that little boy is going to be accented for sure. He's going to be highlighted, right? But there's part of the story that I find very fascinating. Remember when Jesus told them here in Matthew, he says, they don't need to go anywhere. You give them something to eat. Do you remember a conversation in one of the other Gospels about how much money it would take to feed? And you remember who was in that conversation with Jesus? His name was Philip. And it was really funny because when you read the whole story, if you only read one of the Gospels, it almost sounds like the disciples came up with the idea and said, Jesus, do you not understand? It would take 200 denarii to feed all these people, about three-quarters worth of an average salary for a year. Okay? Uh, but that's not how it happened. When you put all the Gospels together, here's what you find out. Jesus, knowing what he was about to do, asked them, how much would it cost? To feed this crowd. You know, they're starting thinking about their 401ks and they're thinking, oh my goodness, is he really wanting us to dig that deep to feed all these? There is just no way. And they came up with 200 denarii. That's about how much they figured it would cost. Now, y'all know there's more than 5,000 people. Estimates are there may be close to 20,000 that were there that day when you got all the women and all the children. So here's the story with all four Gospels. It's not that long, okay? Look, that's all it is. Can y'all pay attention that long? Because you're going to get every aspect, every dimension of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all put into the story of the feeding of the 5,000. This is the Paul Harvey version. <laughs> this is the rest of the story. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Jesus departed by ship on the Sea of Galilee to a deserted place to rest privately. The place was called Bethsaida. Jesus went up on a mountain and sat with his disciples. It was time of the Passover. People found out and followed on foot because they saw him perform miracles. So many were coming and going that there was no time to eat. The people literally ran on foot and out with them. Jesus saw the great crowd. He was moved with compassion. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Jesus taught the crowd about the kingdom of God and many other things. He even healed the sick. The day was far spent. It was getting late and the people were hungry. Jesus asked Philip, where shall we buy bread to feed all these people? 
Philip answered and said, it would take close to a year's wage to feed this many people. Jesus knew all along what he was going to do. The disciples told Jesus to send them away. The disciples told Jesus to send them away into the villages so they can buy their own food. You know, imagine the local McDonald's and Taco Bells. They would have been overrun. Now, Chick-fil-A could have handled it. I'm just saying. I've been in line at Chick-fil-A, and I'm like car number 30, and I still get out in three minutes. I don't know how they do that. Jesus said to the disciples, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Go and see. Andrew told Jesus that there was a boy there who had five loaves and two fish, but that would be nothing to a crowd this size. Jesus asked for the loaves and the fish to be brought to him. Jesus commanded that the people sit down in groups of 100 and groups of 50. There was much grass where they were. They all sat down. The men alone numbered about 5,000, not counting women and children. Jesus took the loaves and the fish. He looked to heaven. He blessed it, gave thanks, and then he gave to the disciples to distribute to all the people. The people all ate. They were filled. Jesus told his disciples to gather up the leftovers. Yes, Jesus believes in leftovers. So that nothing would be lost or wasted. There was enough leftovers to fill up 12 baskets. The people saw and they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. I would challenge you, go back and read Matthews, Mark, Luke, and John's, and you'll see all those things that were mentioned in this particular kind of a story format of putting all four Gospels together. Now, when we think about the life of Jesus and all the 199 things that took place in the Gospels, this is just one of those 199. I love coming to one of the ones where all four Gospels tell us the story because it's so unique to get the different perspectives. Why did Matthew mention some things that John didn't? Why did John mention the boy? Uh, why did... Uh, one say the disciples asked Jesus to send them away, but they don't say anything about the fact that Jesus knew all along what he was about to do when he said how much money would it take to feed all these people. I mean, it's just a fascinating, fascinating story. But here are some parts of the story that also intrigue me. I do believe that there were other people that had some food with them, but no one offered it. I don't know how much, maybe some beef jerky, you know, something to snack on, a biscuit. I mean, who knows? Don't know. Maybe very, very little. But I think this mama knew her son pretty well. They thought, if he's going out for the day, I know that he needs to be taken care of. So she was sure, I think, to pack a good lunch for him, five loaves and two fish. And I just kind of wondered what was going on in the heart and the mind of that little boy. Because Jesus said to his disciples, he said, don't, don't send them away. Go and see. Go and see what we have. And they came back, and all they came back with was five loaves and two fish. What's unique about the story to me is that this boy was willing to give what he had. That speaks volumes to me. Let me ask you. Let's put some application to this. You say, oh, I know where you're headed with this, Brother Steve, and I ain't got much. That's fine. That's fine. Five loaves and two fish, that ain't a whole lot. Among maybe 20,000 people, look what God did with what the boy gave. That's what I want you to see. Give God what you have. And just sit back. And watch what he can do with so little. It is literally amazing. In fact, it's so amazing that all four Gospels tell us the story. And we're telling it over and over and over all the time. Hundreds of years later, we're still telling the story. Because it was indeed a miracle of God. You know, I get really discouraged with preachers today who tried to explain away the miracles. I alluded to something that one preacher has taken, and he has tried to explain away this miracle by saying that once the boy gave his food, 
other people decided they would give their food. That part's not recorded in Scripture. And by the time everybody anted up on everything they had, everybody was able to eat and be filled. There were 12 baskets left over. You know what I say to that? <coughs> Wrong answer. It's a miracle. And can you imagine this little boy? I can only imagine. Maybe 10, 11, 12 years old. But can you imagine when Jesus, it tells us in the Gospels that he, he blessed it. He prayed over it. That's why we pray over our meals, one of the reasons why. Amen. I remember one time we were having a, a funeral meal for a family at our church. I mean, a whole lot more people showed up than what they told us. You know what we started doing? We started praying over that meal. And it was amazing how God just made it go so much further. We, we experienced a, a little, it wasn't 20,000 people. And we started off with more than five loaves and two fish. But he sure seemed to stretch that a long way because our ladies were getting very, very nervous. But can you imagine the little boy when Jesus blessed it, he broke it, and then he began to reach into that basket. This is the way I picture it. And he began to take out of that basket food and give to the disciples, which we know that part. He gave to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the people. They all sat down in groups. By the way, you know, this was a big deal for men to sit down with other women like this. In, a, in their culture, men didn't do this. And for them to sit down showed that they were being submissive to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Some of us men need to hear that whatever Jesus tells us to do is not just for the women and the kids. Thank God for men who lead their families to church. Thank God for men who don't say, here's what they say. They don't say, are we going? They say, when is everybody going to be ready? Because we are going to church today, okay? But this little boy, can you imagine as he began to take out this food out of the basket? I can just imagine how he just wanted to run up and stick his head down in the basket thinking, good grief, how is this happening? As Jesus continued to pull out more and more and more, how long did that take to feed somewhere close to 20,000 people? And I imagine that when he got home, he had a story to tell. And I just have a, a suspicion that this boy was real good about telling stories. His mama had dealt with, you know how little boys can make up stuff, you know, when they go out into the woods and they saw a big bear or whatever, you know, they come back with this huge story that mom's going, uh, uh-huh. Now imagine that day he came back with a story, his eyes as big as saucers, telling his mama everything that had happened. And his mom was probably like, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, I get it. And then, in just a matter of minutes, her phone started blowing up. Text messages and emails, or well, maybe not, but word got around. And can you imagine how that mama might have felt to know that her son was the one who gave? And because he gave, 20,000 people ate and were filled. And listen. Part of what's missed sometimes about the story is I think part of the reason that Jesus wanted to feed them is so they would continue to hunger and thirst over his teaching. Because like many Baptists, you know why we quit at 12 o'clock? Stomachs are growling, and we know it's time for you to go eat. Uh, I joked around for years at first that, ooh, we're out of time. Uh, for years, I joked around at First Baptist Redwood about how everybody just needs to bring a sack lunch. And as soon as the preaching's over, we're going to eat, and we're going to come right back into the sanctuary. And uh, y'all need to do that sometime. You know, just freak Mike out big time. Everybody show up with your lunch. Y'all can do this through text messaging. Y'all could all say, okay, on this day, don't tell him, but we're all going to show up with a sack lunch. And y'all come in with your lunch. He's going to say, what's that? And he said, well, after church, we're going to have our lunch, and we're coming back in. We want to hear more. Now, you'll have to do CPR on him. Because I've never heard of anybody that loves a long-winded preacher. But if you want to hear more, that will thrill, thrill his heart. Amen. I hope that what I've shared with you will cause you want to want to know more. And I pray that the one thing you'll take away, there's, there's, there are several takeaways from this 
passage, but here's the one thing uh, I want you to remember as you leave. Give God what you have. And after you do that, just sit back and watch and see what he does with it. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to proclaim goodness. I pray that people here who may not know Jesus, I pray that they would begin to, to see the way that he loves people and all that this church preaches and teaches about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I pray that like this young girl who accepted you this past Wednesday, I pray that others would continue to hear the gospel of Jesus, the miracles that Jesus did, the things that he taught, and that they would be drawn to him. Not drawn to a preacher, not drawn to music in particular, but be drawn to what the preacher is preaching about and be drawn to what the music is proclaiming. This we pray in Jesus' name.